Hello everyone, we are back at it again this evening with our third lecture from the language chapter for AP Human Geography, unit number three, that is cultural patterns and processes. Tonight we are mainly talking about other language families. Last lecture we looked a lot at the Indo-European language family, so tonight we're mainly going to be looking at some of the other language families that are uh, especially prominent all over the world. So let's get started with some of the language families that we see in East Asia. So we'll start with the second largest language family in the world uh, of which contains the most widely spoken first language in the world and that is Sino-Tibetan. Sino uh, once again is Latin for China or Chinese and so uh, when you see that we're talking about China. Specifically in China we see the Sinitic branch uh, the other branch, uh, as the name kind of implies, is the Tibetan branch of Indo or of Sino-Tibetan. And uh, in the Sinitic branch, you're going to have Mandarin, which is about three fourths of the Sinitic branch and three fourths of the speakers of Sino-Tibetan. And uh, Cantonese is another form of Chinese. So you, you have to be careful when you're talking about Chinese language because there's lots of different languages that are spoken in China. Um, so you have to be a little bit more specific with that. So just be careful. Um, in addition to that, we also have uh, the Japanese language family. Uh, our textbook includes the Korean language family as well. We could add that to our East Asian uh, language families. Uh, though there is, a, again, some discrepancy about that because there are some uh, language experts who combine Japanese with Korean with the Altaic language family. Our textbook does not, but you know it bears mentioning just in case we on the off chance happen to see that. Um, our next language family that we're going to be looking at is the Afro-Asiatic -Asi language family. Um, sometimes you might see it as Hamitic, Semitic, uh, or Hamido-Semitic language family. Um, I, I don't think you're really going to see it. Uh, I think this is more of an old-fashioned name for this particular language family. Uh, you also may not see the dash there. It may just be a singular word, Afro-Asiatic. A uh, couple different branches there. The most prominent is the Semitic branch of Afro-Asiatic. And that includes uh, the two most widely, well, certainly the most widely spoken language in uh, the Afro-Asiatic language family, and that is Arabic. Arabic, make sure that you know that this is the language family from which Arabic comes from. Uh, and again, we see it in North Africa, Southwest Asia. And you can see on the, the right-hand side of the screen there that we have uh, some of the visuals from our textbook that correspond with this, and that helps to give us some context to it, because some of us are, uh, you know, visual learners. We need the images to to go along with it. Others can pick it up just from the the words on the screen there. But make sure that you you have that. But to be clear, um, there's a lot of diversity with all of these languages, and remember the hourglass shape that we said. Uh, so just within the singular language that is Arabic of the larger Afroasiatic language family, the Semitic branch of that, um, there's a lot of different dialects, and that's what you see here. Uh, so in this case, this is a choropleth map. Scale is a little bit more challenging because there's no political boundaries here, uh, and they're not subnational units. Uh, so the boundaries are just the boundaries, the, the dialectical boundaries of these particular Arabic dialects. So that's what we're taking a look here to see. Continuing on, a couple other language families that we should be familiar with. Austronesian, uh, we mentioned it in an earlier lecture, uh, our last lecture, as also known as the Malayo-Polynesian, and that's going to reference a couple of the different uh, languages that we see as part of this, but I'm going to tell you guys, uh, it is possible that you will see that, though it's kind of rare. Uh, I see it much more often as Austronesian. 
So just be aware of that. As far as the extent of this, and this is once again something that you'll have to be able to do, you'll have to know uh, the geographic range of these different language families and be able to identify, you know, if they give you a country, we should be able to make a reasonable guess as to what the language family is in that particular area. Uh, so as the alternative name for Austronesian, Malayo-Polynesian kind of suggests, it stretches all the way from uh, the Pacific Ocean, specifically the islands of Polynesia, all the way to Madagascar. So that's a very wide uh, geographic area for this one specific language family. And lots of diversity of languages here, though there are a few that are especially prominent. Javanese in Indonesia uh, is one that is especially prominent. Tagalog in the Philippines, uh, as well as Malagasy and Hawaiian, uh, some of the more prominent languages that, that we would associate with Austronesian. But to be clear, um, one statistic I saw had it as many as 1,200 different languages as part of the Austronesian language family. So very, very, very large. The Dravidian language family is found in southern India as well as Sri Lanka. And that's something that, uh, as far as geographic area, we need to know. Um, but a couple different languages that we should be familiar with, Tamil, as well as Malayam. Continuing on, Niger Congo is uh, one of the most widely spoken language families in the world. Uh, depending on your source, it can be anywhere from you know third to fourth as far as largest. Sometimes Afroasiatic and Niger Congo are switched in terms of largest language families. Uh, we have it as fourth on our list. And Niger Congo constitutes about 95% of the population of Sub-Saharan Africa. Uh, will speak a, uh, the population will speak a language that is part of the Niger Congo language family. Uh, one really interesting example is Swahili. Swahili is a fantastic example of what we will define next lecture as a lingua franca. So I would write that out to the side because this is a really good example of this. And so we've got some, some evidence here to explain what that is. Um, as a first language, there's not a lot of people that speak Swahili as a first language. Less than a million uh, from one particular source. It is the official language, though, in Tanzania, Kenya, though it should also be noted it's also official in Uganda as well. However, as a second language, as a language that people will, will know to communicate with others, 50 million Africans speak Swahili. And so it is going to cut a much larger geographic swath as a lingua franca, as a trade language, as a language that people use to communicate with, with others who don't speak the same standard language, first language. Great example to pull from and talk about, uh, especially if we were to get an FRQ on language and specifically a lingua franca. Um, many African languages are going to lack what we call a literary tradition. This is a definition, so please make sure that you are underlining. A literary tradition is a language that is written as well as spoken. So when we say that many African languages lack a written tradition, it mean, uh, sorry, literary tradition, it means that they don't have a written component to it. It's just the spoken element, which, as we pointed out in lecture number one from this unit, makes these languages a little bit more susceptible to language extinction. Now we're going to talk about literary traditions and written language here in just a moment. The Altaic language family, uh, quite controversial. I've seen lots of different articles uh, uh, debating the Altaic language family. Uh, I kind of describe the, geogra the geographic distribution of the Altaic language family as stretching from Turkey to Mongolia through Central Asia. And so that's going to cut from 
Turkey all the way to Mongolia, including uh, several of our Central Asian former Soviet republics. There are exceptions, like for example in Armenia. Uh, Armenian is a language branch of the Indo-European language family, so that's that's an exception. Uh, but generally speaking, it's it's more, much more of a linear pattern if we take a look at that language map. And so make sure that you know that. Um, again, there is some discrepancy here with whether or not uh, the Altaic language family includes Korean and Japanese as part of it. And if we were to look geographically, uh, that linear pattern, if we were to continue it, would move into the Korean Peninsula and the Japanese islands. So we can at least see maybe why some of that discrepancy does exist, why some of that debate does exist. But uh, again, a lot of times we bring up some of these, these side points and some of these debatable points so that we understand uh, different perspectives so that we're prepared with no matter what we see on the AP exam. As we mentioned on the last slide, we said we were going to talk about some written language. And there's two broad categories for written language. There are logograms and phonetics. Okay. Now, logograms are, are categorized into two uh, categories as well. Pictograms and ideograms or ideograms. And once again, it's a vocabulary term, so we want to make sure that we're familiar with it. Here is the definition. The system of writing used in China and other East Asian countries in which each symbol represents an idea. That's really important. Each symbol represents an idea or a concept rather than a specific sound. Phonetics are about sounds. So make sure that you know that as is the case with letters in English. Um, we know that ours is an alphabet, so the letters in the English alphabet, which is actually more specifically the Roman or Latin alphabet, uh, each letter represents a sound. Whereas with ideograms, they represent an idea. So make sure that we understand that. On the phonetic side, when sounds are 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 used. We have syllabaries and alphabets. We're going to look at each of these in a little bit more detail on the coming slides. So as far as logograms go, we have pictograms and ideograms. And pictograms, really good example of that is early Egyptian hieroglyphics. And if we take a look at the image down there, you know, each of the, the pictograms kind of look like what they're supposed to represent. You look at the swallow, it's a bird. A swallow is a type of bird. You look at the beetle, it looks like a bug. So it, it, some of the, they, they're rather intuitive. All right. The ideograms, and this is a really good example for Chinese written language. Each character represents an idea. So in order to be fluent in written Chinese language, you might have to know thousands of characters in order to be fluent. And our textbook uses uh, uh, the, the visual that you see down below with a person and the sun. And we can combine different ideas, different symbols, characters, to represent different things. So when we start combining some of these different elements, um, I really like to, to kind of look at this because... Um, you take a look in a person, it almost kind of looks like a person. You've got two legs there. Um, but when you start combining sun and person, you get different uh, variations of this. Uh, for example, the second one is a, a, a big person. All right, so you combine sun and the sky with a person, big person. Okay? Now, you take that a step further, you add the top bar again, and that's your symbol for heaven because it's above the biggest person. So there is an intuitive nature to this. You know, the characters do make sense with our kind of understanding. The heavens, the skies, heaven itself is above the tallest person. And so the characters kind of make sense with, within that, that, that realm as well. 
Again, phonetics are about sounds. And so we have, again, two different categories. We have syllabaries and alphabets. A syllabary is when an arbitrary symbol is associated with each sound or syllable in a particular language. Now, as I have said several times throughout the year, and as I will continue to say as the year progresses, um, this is really a survey course. All right. Yeah, we get into a lot of details and things like that, but we could get into even more details. For example, I've had several students in the past bring up to me that there are different Japanese for, forms of Japanese written language. And so in order to get into even greater detail with this, this is just a this is just a, a an example of a syllabary is that in Japanese written language there are 75 symbols in the Cherokee written language 85 different symbols and so you have those represent different sounds syllables that are present in the language the alphabet or an alphabet is going to be when you have a very small number of symbols that represent all sounds and so the first alphabet is the Phoenician alphabet. And we're going to take a look at an example and how the Phoenician alphabet kind of turned into the Arabic alphabet as well as the modern Roman alphabet, which is the same alphabet that we use in the English language. And really throughout much of, um, I would say, the Germanic and Romance regions of Indo-European, as we will see on a later map. Uh, so on this particular graphic, we can see the Phoenician alphabet there in the middle. And remember, again, an alphabet is each symbol corresponding to a sound. And you can kind of see the progression that leads in, in both different directions, you know, moving away in it from Phoenician into Greek and Aramaic, and then eventually becoming both the modern Roman or Latin alphabet, as you may sometimes see it, and the Arabic alphabet. They developed in different directions. So this just kind of gives us an idea. Uh, and again, each of these correspond with different sounds. That's important to understand. Uh, this is kind of an interesting map. I, I, I kind of came across this one, and I, I really think it is quite interesting. And it looks at the word Wikipedia. I assume it's the word Wikipedia in all these different languages because I, I only actually speak English and I only read the, the Latin or Roman alphabet. So I actually don't know what it says uh, in any of these other uh, forms of written language. But I, I believe it's just the word Wikipedia in all of these different forms of written language. So we have a choropleth map. Scale's a little challenging because the, the boundaries are between different systems of writing rather than political boundaries. But it's just kind of interesting to see the wide variety of written languages in the world and to see how they are at times both similar and quite different. So the blue areas are the, the Latin or Roman alphabet. Um, green is going to be the Arabic alphabet. Yellow, the Chinese alphabet. Uh, red is the Cyrillic alphabet, and that's the alphabet that's largely associated with uh, the Balto-Slavic language branch of Indo-European, just to, to make some connections across different uh, parts of the curriculum. So take a look at the map, take a look at some of these different forms. I know many of you actually are able to read different uh, languages and, and different forms of written language, so I, I'm interested in in your interpretation of this. Or do you have any observations about this, any commentary about this map? Because I, I find it kind of interesting, but I'm interested in your insight as well. Um, so I included a couple pictures from my travels. Uh, this, these next two pictures come from uh, the It's a Small World ride at Disneyland Paris in France. And outside the It's a Small World ride, they had the, the words It's a Small World 
written in a variety of different languages. So I actually included several different interpretations. I had to translate this uh, using Google Translate. So it's not perfect, I'll admit that. Uh, but there's a couple things that I noticed and, and I, I'd be very interested if any of you are able to, to read and write this, if my interpretations have been correct. You can see there French, Arabic, Greek, um, but when I, I translated it, it seemed more as it would have been said rather than as it is actually written. Um, the next one I, I think is supposed to be Swedish. It was the, the closest that I was able to, to make a connection to, Italian, Chinese. I believe that next one is supposed to be Swahili. That is the closest interpretation I was able to get, but it wasn't perfect. Spanish, Dutch, Japanese, German. So there was a lot of different uh, languages. And I thought that was really fascinating because in Disneyland Paris, you get a lot of different people from all over the world speaking lots of different languages. So I thought that this was, was kind of an interesting one. And even the rides in Disneyland Paris were kind of different because, you know, Indiana Jones and um, some of these other rides that have like stories to them, if you go to, to the regular Disneyland, um, don't have those same stories. Indiana Jones is just a roller coaster in Disneyland Paris. Um, because there's so many people that speak different languages, and how are you going to tell that story in all of these different languages? So it was really kind of fascinating to see. It was really kind of an interesting cultural experience to, to see that. Um, this was taken at the airport in... Ireland. And uh, in Ireland, Ireland is officially bilingual, both English and Irish Gaelic, which is part of the Celtic branch or Celtic branch of Indo-European. And so every sign that we saw was printed in two different languages, English and Irish Gaelic. And you can see the differences there. This sign uh, was taken, or this picture we took in France. And so I'm gonna ask you to just very quickly write down what are some of the languages that you see written in this particular sign? It's a good little practice of identifying elements of the cultural landscape. Take a moment, uh, identify this. What do you think you see? based on, on some of the different uh, alphabets, some of the different forms of written language that we have talked about, ideograms, phonetics, all those different types of things. What do you see here? And a uh, couple different things. Again, this was taken in France. And even though it looks like uh, the top line says silence, uh, it actually would be pronounced silence. So that's actually the pronunciation and spelling in both English and French. Uh, silencio, Spanish as well as Portuguese. Uh, Portuguese would have, uh, I believe, an accent with that. So this is without the accent that would appear uh, in the word. Silencio, Italian. Uh, we see there the Cyrillic alphabet that is Russian, but it's very, very similar to Ukrainian. And then the ideograms that you see in the bottom right, that is Chinese, but very, very similar to Japanese. Even though Chinese and Japanese, two different languages uh, and two different language families, the written form, actually there's some similarities there. They actually derive from a common origin. So here's how we are going to wrap up to tonight's lecture. We're going to have a little bit of fun. We're going to do an exit sign quiz. And uh, when I was Crafting this, I, I tried to think, okay, what's, uh, you know, what's something where we could see a lot of different languages uh, and see a lot of different ways that things are, are said um, that would be, you know, practical, would be helpful. And knowing how to get out of a particular place is pretty important. I think refreshments are important on this sign in front of you as well. But being able to get out, you know, in the, the case of an emergency, knowing how the, the exit signs appear in different countries, different languages, different written forms of language would be, I think, hopefully helpful. And so 
This is an element of identifying the cultural landscape. So let's see how we do. I'm going to have you jot down your guesses. I'm not going to tell you the answers tonight. Jot down your guesses for where this is, what language it is in. All right. And if you can be more specific, be more specific. If you can tell me, uh, you know, not only the country where you think it is, or not only the language, but if you can tell me the country, tell me the country. If you can not only tell me uh, the the country, but the city, great. As specific as you can be. All right, here we go. Your first one, way out. What do you think? What do you think? Is there anything in the background that, that might be able to help you with this? What do you think? Our next one. What language? Third one. This one. I, I know some students will be able to, to get more specific on this slide. So how, how specific can you be? Do you know the country? Do you know the city? Do you know the landmark as well? Our next one. What language are we seeing here? Our next one. A little bit of... Uh, religious background there as well and perhaps influence us as we go our next one what's your guess what language do you think think of you know is it an alphabet is it ideograms where do you where do you think this is going to be what's your what's your guess our next one Continuing on, look at that, Dora is able to read the sign, she knows which way to go. The language. And our final one for this evening, Dora has figured it out, she knows which way to go in order to find her way out. Hopefully you will be able to as well. Bring those guesses to class tomorrow, we're going to go over this as part of our bridge question at the beginning of class. Thank you, everyone. Have a wonderful night. I'll see you in class tomorrow.